right, well, I sat there in the studio and was like, Tommy, you know, what have you learned, bro? What did you learn? And I learned that they like, you know, minor progressions. Dre all day, right? <laughs> right? It's minor stuff, right? Suspended to minor stuff. So I said, okay, they like minor keys and, and um, they like classical sounds and it has to be something hooky and bouncy. So I had these headphones on and I picked this harpsichord sound and I'm like, okay, that's, a, that's kind of a fun sound. And I'm like... Now that's that's a, such a jazz lick. So I can literally play. So I can literally play. Now check this out, another song that my family's a part writer on is a song called Europa, which you've probably heard, a Santana song. <laughs> It's, 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 it's so much a part of my DNA. So I came up with that lick, and I said, hey, turn my keyboard back on. And the Seagal, who was the engineer at the time, turned my keyboard back on, and Dre had this beat just banging at like 90 or 91, and I'm like... <laughs> and M's just like, dude, Tommy, keep playing that. Keep playing that. I'm like, okay. And he started writing, and then the, the bass player, Mike Elizondo at the time, he wrote the bass line... It's like a counterpoint. It's cl classical music at that point. Classical chord progression. Very, very classical. And that was it. That was the end of it. And the interesting part about that is records like that usually get about 2,000 songs submitted and considered. And then they end up with, you know, 15, 17 songs. Could be Celine Dion, could be M, could be Mariah, whoever could be a band writing a bunch of material. And that song never had any resistance from anybody, not from M, not from Dre, not from Jimmy, not from the label. It just, it was like, Mo I, I describe it as Moses parting the sea because that very rarely happens. So I, I, I'm very um, proud to say that if I wasn't in the studio that day, that song probably wouldn't exist. Absolutely. Um, and then M wrote all the lyrics, Dre produced it. He um, changed the drum beat a little bit to fit better with the, the harmonic and, and, and rhythmic cadences that were happening. And then um, we got together one more time after that, Dre and I, and did all the keyboard parts. He wanted a timpani roll. He, there's, a, there's a guitar solo at the end, and I just played a synth thing, and that was it. And I had no idea what had just happened except that I had shown up and, and done what I was hired to do. And it ended up being one of the one of the most historical tracks in the history of hip hop coming out of Absolutely. M's career, aside from uh, "Lose Yourself." And um, I don't think M cares for the song very much because it's more on the commercial side, and he's a very authentic artist. He certainly understands its position in in his career. But the interesting thing about that song is Jimmy knew that they needed a, a, a single to open up the record because it was a heavy record, and that song crossed over. You had. 12, 13-year-old Jewish kids playing it at their bat mitzvahs or whatever, and you had the urban community embracing this this white rapper in a, in a predominantly black industry uh, genre of music, and then you had like middle America, 30-year-old white people that were farmers going, wow, that song's fun. <laughs> so it, it was one of those songs that, that carried over, pushed boundaries down, and, and a very...